Hello, my name is Jens Juhlholst. I'm from the University of Copenhagen, and I'm here to talk about the exploration and pharmacological potential of the incretin system in humans on the occasion of the Gardner Day. So let's talk about the incretin effect. So this is the incretin effect, and it's about amplification of insulin secretion, <clears throat> as it is seen after a meal. And here it's a glucose meal, and uh, it's made in such a way that the glucose excursions are the same on one day when glucose is taken in by the oral route, and another day where it's taken in by the intravenous route. And if you then compare the insulin responses, you can see that there is much more insulin being secreted after the oral day. That's the increasing effect. <clears throat> Let's have a bit, bit closer look at it, because it's really a formidable effect. It's very, very powerful. So what was done here in these experiments by Michael Nauck was that he gave people 25 grams of glucose to drink, or 50 grams of glucose to drink, or 100 grams of glucose to drink. And then he measured the glucose excursions. They are here. And then he copied the glucose excursions by intravenous infusions. And you can see that he was very good at it. And up here we have the amounts of glucose that was required for copying of those excursions. And the most important thing you note from this curve is that these glucose excursions, they're almost the same, regardless of the huge difference in dose of glucose. And <clears throat> accordingly, uh, so it took 20 grams of glucose to copy this one, the 25 grams. It also took 20 grams to copy the 50 gram. And it also took 20 grams to copy the 100 gram. So in other words, there is a mechanism out there that is capable of removing 80% of all the glucose that we take in from the, from, the, from, the, from the vascular system, remove it so that it does not challenge the body. So this is of course an extremely powerful uh, mechanism. And the secret behind it is of course that there is an increase in insulin secretion, which is dependent on this meal size or amount of glucose. So here you see the insulin responses to the 25 grams, they're small, and then the responses increase gradually the more glucose you take in. So uh, it tells us that the incretin effect is dose dependent and also that it becomes more and more efficient the more glucose or carbohydrate you take in. So this is a hormonal effect that has to do with the oral intake of nutrients. So which hormones are responsible for this? And, and back in 1973, the new uh, hormone, which has just been isolated, GIP, gastric inhibitory polypeptide, uh, was supposed to be one of the factors here because it could increase insulin secretion very much when put on top of glucose. And <clears throat> as you can see from these experiments, insulin secretion was much increased in spite of lower glucose concentrations. So this was the beginning, but um, this was not entirely convincing to be the only incretin. And there were many reasons for that. One of them was that GIP immunoneutralization could not remove all of the increase in effect. And we also showed that. And for us, the most important was that if you did, uh, if you looked at people with intestinal resections, the increase in effect, which we could measure in this way, did not correlate with GIP secretion, but with the length of distal small intestine remaining. And it, disappointingly, porcine increase was inactive in type two diabetic patients. So what we were interested in was instead these cells from the gut, and uh, they are stained with an antibody against glucagon. This is immunofluorescence. And you can see that there are these nice endocrine cells in the gut that stain with antibodies against glucagon. And that is, of course, strange because what is glucagon doing in the gut? And it turned out that there are many different uh, glucagon antibodies. And uh, the pioneer in this area was Lisa Heating, my first mentor. And um, she had worked with this for, for, some, uh, for, a, for a while and found that some of these anti glucagon antibodies would react with the, an extract of the gut, but some would not. And those over here, that, they are the ones we call specific antibodies because they only react with pancreatic glucagon, whereas those over here were called unspecific or cross-reacting antibodies. 
So some antibodies could see this material from the gut, others could not. And uh, that means that we could also measure differences. If you looked at people that had glucose stimulation or glucose stimulation, those that could react, they would see, a, they would measure an increase in what we then called gut glucon-like immune reactivity. Whereas those that were specific, they measured a decrease. So indicating that glucon secretion would fall out of the glucose. So um, we, there was a difference here. Uh, so we uh, got the idea, a little bit crazy idea, that this gut glucagon thing could be uh, the pathogenetic factor in reactive hypoglycemia. And that was because we had measured people with some, with some people with, with reactive hypoglycemia and had noted that they had a high secretion of this gut material and also a very high secretion of insulin, of course, and reactive hypoglycemia. And since glucagon could stimulate insulin secretion, we felt that this could probably be the responsible factor. So around 1983, we had been working with this for a long time. And we and people from the Novo Nordisk company had found out what this thing in the gut was really all about. So it turned out that it was due to this molecule, which is called glycentin, a molecule of 69 amino acids, which contains the entire glucagon sequence here in the middle. And that explains, of course, the immune reactivity. Um, for various reasons, we did, didn't think that glycentin was really the interesting peptide. There was a fragment of glycentin in the gut also comprising glucagon plus this extension here. And uh, that was called oxintomodulin eventually. <clears throat> and that could actually stimulate insulin secretion, but it was not particularly powerful and perhaps not present in sufficient high concentrations. But nevertheless, this was the situation. And we concluded that this was a part of the pro-glucagon molecule. Um, and, and this is what uh, this is how glucagon was synthesized. And that was because we could also find this molecule in all these fragments in the pancreas. So that was likely to be true. But um, oxintomodulin here is shown here where it can stimulate insulin secretion, as you can see nicely, but it's not very powerful. And um, it was not what we thought would be the responsible factor. What then happened was that <clears throat> Bell and co-workers published the pre-proglucagon -pre sequence from first hamsters and then uh, uh, people afterwards. So here is the full molecule, the full proglucagon -pro molecule. And it sure enough contained this part of the molecule, which was called glycentin. And so this was completely confirmed. But it also contained two additional glucagon-like peptides, GLP-1 and GLP-2. Uh, so we immediately created radioimmunoassays. It just took us a few weeks for GLP-1 and GLP-2 and started to look for them. And we also had these sequences synthesized and looked at them. So let's have a look here. What we found with our new radioimmune assays was that if we are looking at GLP-1 and GLP-2 in extracts from the pancreas and the gut, GLP-1 and GLP-2 would be present in a large molecule. Whereas in the gut, GLP-1 would be present in a small molecule, and GLP-2 would also be present in a small molecule. These are uh, gel permeation chromatography, where we could look at the molecular size. And we could also look at the secretion from the pancreas here, we're stimulating the secretion with arginine, glucagon comes out, immunoreactive GLP-1 as well, GLP-2 as well. And also from the gut, when it gave it glucose, GLP-1 would come out, bombesin also, and GLP-2 would come out with glucose and bombesin. And we could look at the sizes of those molecules from the pancreas. Here you have GLP-1, a large molecule, and here you have GLP-1 from the gut in a small molecule. So what we came out with was this predictive processing of proglucagon in pancreas and gut. Here we have proglucagon. Here we have the cleavage sites. Here we have glucagon. So what we predicted was that in the pancreas, glucagon would come out, of course, and everything would be together, GLP-1 and GLP-2, in this large fragment, which we call the major proglucagon fragment. Whereas in the gut, those sequences would be cleaved out and be released and secreted. Uh, so now the question came up, what could be the action of these? And as I said, we had them synthesized, so we could put them on the perfused pancreas, and we had this big pancreas that can produce a lot of insulin and also some pancreatic juice, which is very reassuring, of course. Um, and we looked at it, but sadly, none of these peptides had any effect on anything, uh, not insulin, not glucagon, not anything. So... Um, 
then we started to say this this can't be that we will have to do better than that so uh, there must be something down there and so we used our assays to fish out uh, naturally occurring GLP-1 molecules from uh, extracts of the gut and looked at them on the isolated perfused pancreas. And now we could find a molecule which was very powerful in terms of stimulating insulin secretion indeed. And eventually we managed to, uh, to identify the structure of this molecule that we had pulled out. And here we have it, it was a truncated form of this GLP-1 sequence in the gut, which was furthermore amidated we found. And we also isolated GLP-2 and found that this was also slightly modified compared to what we had already. But so this was the real uh, GLP-1 molecule and otherwise uh, all the things were confirmed. So GLP-1 was looked at again in insulin secretion here. And uh, here we can see what happens with the glucose dependency and at low glucose levels, there's no effect. At uh, normal glucose levels, there is some effect. And at higher glucose levels, there's a large effect of GLP-1 on insulin secretion from our pancreas. And that was of course very interesting because uh, it, it, this it was completely glucose dependent, this action. But the other thing we found, which was very surprising and very interesting, was that it also very powerfully inhibited glucagon secretion. And this was in contrast to GIP. So it's a very powerful inhibition of GLP-1 secretion from our perfused pancreas. And this is interesting because if you think of it, what happens in the body when glucose is too high, when you take in meals after a meal here, then you have the pancreas that releases insulin and brings down the glucose but because glucose is taken up in the body and the liver stops producing glucose. And what happens if the glucose is fasting, as you see here, during, is, is falling, but during fasting, then the pancreas starts to release glucagon and, and, and uh, makes the liver produce glucose. So um, if you have something that hits both glucagon and insulin, then you have a double mechanism that can regulate uh, the glucose uh, production in the body and the uptake and regulate glucose concentrations. And sure enough, so we infused people with synthetic GLP-1, and that's what you can see here, in very physiological amounts, absolutely, and looked at glucagon secretion and insulin secretion. And as you can see, uh, glucagon secretion was inhibited, insulin secretion was stimulated, and as a consequence, hepatic glucose production was inhibited strongly by 30% or so, uh, while we were infusing the GLP-1, and as a consequence of these two changes. Because of this, the plasma glucose also would fall, not very much, by about one millimole per liter, and it would stop immediately once we stopped the infusions, and it would not fall any further in spite of increasing doses of GLP-1. So, so uh, this was really interesting, a, a powerful mechanism, of course. So we could uh, start again looking at our incretin studies and to try to find out about this new hormone GLP-1, if whether it was an important GLP-1 uh, incretin hormone. So what we did was to infuse people with GIP reaching concentrations exactly as you see them after meal intake, or we infuse them with GLP-1 reaching exactly the concentration you see after meal intake. And we did this while maintaining glucose concentrations at the fasting level, clamping them and one millimolar above and one millimolar above again, the covering normal meals. And what you can see is that both of these hormones then stimulated insulin secretion in the fasting state at the fasting glucose level, but at higher concentration as expected, they would increase the insulin secretion even further. So both hormones were active and about equally important apparently for the incretin effect in people looked at it this way. But they also differ of course, because GLP-1 would then inhibit glucagon secretion as clearly shown here, whereas GIP could not do a thing like that. Glucose itself of course inhibits glucagon secretion as well. And we can go back now and look at this experiment with increasing amounts of glucose and have a look at the secretion of GIP and GLP-1. And we can clearly see how they depend on the amount of glucose taken in. So here at 25 grams, uh, a, a, a short lasting response of GIP and also GLP-1, and then higher responses, larger responses to the higher doses of glucose. So now we can completely explain what went on in those experiments, increasing secretion of the increase and hormones, increasing effect on insulin secretion, and that's what explains it. Today, we would probably look at it with a different way. We would look at it with antagonists. So we had already 
early on antagonist of GLP-1 action, namely back to 1993, where XN9 was discovered as an antagonist. Uh, for GIP, we didn't really have an antagonist until we found one, discovered one in 2015, namely um, GIP-3 to 30 amide, which uh, really turned out to be an efficient uh, uh, GIP antagonist. And now it was possible to do antagonism experiments in people. So uh, the GIP receptor is here, GIP 3 to 30 amide. And you can see here that it's a high potent uh, agonist for the GLP-1 receptor, for the GIP receptor, I'm sorry. And that, um, and, and that it does not have any agonist activity no agonistic properties here, and that is, uh, it has a shill plot uh, that is compatible with a competitive antagonism. So it's a very useful and powerful antagonist. So with this antagonist, we could now analyze the Inquitin effect, and we did this both with the GIP receptor antagonist and with the GLP-1 receptor antagonist. And so here we have the studies with placebo and, and the GLP-1 receptor and the GIP receptor antagonist, and with the combination. And the most important of this is if you look at glucose tolerance after an oral glucose tolerance test is you can see that with the combination, when you el eliminate the actions of both incretin hormones, you simply get glucose intolerance. So this finally could show the importance of the incretin system. If you block the actions of the endogenous incretin hormones in people, then you develop glucose intolerance. That tells you how important the system is. We could also look at insulin secretion, and that's what we did here in the same kind of experiments, of course. And down here, we are looking at uh, the C-peptide responses uh, corrected for the glucose increases, because what happened, as I just showed you, was that the glucose was changing, and that means that also the effect of insulin secretion was changing. Therefore, we had to analyze the insulin responses or the C-peptide responses in relation to the glucose. And here you can clearly see that with uh, each of these uh, antagonists, we would inhibit the insulin secretion and uh, together they would be very important for this. And this also means that we can now analyze precisely their contribution to the insulin secretion after an oral glucose tolerance test. And this is what we did. So here we have it. Uh, glucose alone was responsible for 26% of the insulin response. GIP was responsible for 45% of the response, and GLP-1 was responsible for 29% of the response in these experiments. So uh, that was, of course, disappointing for GLP-1, but uh, on the other hand, uh, good for GIP researchers. GIP is an important increase in hormone in people. Uh, but if GLP-1 is not the most important increase in, what is it good for then? And that's when we started to look for appetite and food intake. And uh, in 1998, we found that it indeed, that it would increase satiety and it would decrease hunger in between meals. And during an at libitum meal intake, it would reduce the food intake. Not very much, but still very significantly. And here you see that uh, the, it is dose-dependent. Uh, dose so the more you infuse of GLP-1 here, uh, the more you will decrease energy intake here in percentage in percent. So the nice relationship here. So it really does this. You can ask, is this a physiological action of GLP-1? And we think it is. So again, we can use extend in 9 to 39, which is the antagonist of the GLP-1 receptor, and try to analyze food intake. Here we're looking at some obese individuals, and we're trying to see if, if GLP-1 has any effect on this. And you can see that they increased their food intake after the antagonist, suggesting that GLP-1 indeed was playing a, a, an inhibitory role normally, which was then blocked by the uh, receptor blocker. How does it do it? How does it do it? Was it an effect on the stomach? Uh, we knew that there were effects on gastric emptying. I'll come back to that in a while. Uh, we think that it's of minor relevance for this. Uh, on the contrary, we have central effects and it's the possibility that GLP-1 can reach the circumventricular organs. And we found that back in 1996. And we also found that there was centrally produced GLP-1 that could act in this system here. And then, of course, uh, there could be interaction with sensory vehicle efforts. So uh, what happens is that we have here a crypt in the small intestine of people, and this is an L cell. And what you see out here is the capillary. 
And this capillary has been stained for a specific molecule, namely an enzyme called dipeptidyl peptidase 4. So uh, this capillary is full of this enzyme. And what happens with this enzyme? This enzyme can cleave the GLP-1 molecule, cut off these two N-terminal amino acids, and this part of the molecule is then inactive in terms of insulin secretion. And it, it, it turned out that this was an incredibly extensive and rapid mechanism. So here we have uh, the half-life, which is just one to two minutes in people, and the metabolic clearance rate was enormous. So this was really an extensive thing. How does that make sense? So it turns out if we look at it here, that we have a villus down here and the L cell that produces GLP-1. And now it's stimulated and GLP-1 will, will diffuse in its intact form over here and get absorbed by the capillary. And here there will be DPP-4 ready to destroy it. And sure enough, we found that only a fraction of the GLP-1 that is secreted survives in the intact form. Here I've put 25%. And then these 25% arrive at the liver and the liver is again equipped with DPP-4 activity so that only half survives. And now we're down to 12%. And there is also some soluble uh, DPP-4 activity in the plasma uh, that kills a further a, a number of, of the molecules so that eventually when we come to the organ, the target organ, there's very little active DLP-1 left. That seems to be a strange and ridiculous system. But what we found was that there's another way that this can, this can be active, activated. And that is by sensory afferents of the vagus seen here. And you can see that they can trans they have the cell bodies up in the nodose ganglion and send uh, axons into the nucleus of the solitary tract. And here, these excited neurons here can then either interact with vagal nuclei or the vagal motor nuclei here, or send, that's shown, uh, 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 the axons to the hypothalamus, where they can interact with various centers up here. So that's what, how we think that uh, the TLP1 mainly acts, the newly secreted TLP1, that it acts via these sensory afferents on the vagus. And uh, so what is the, uh, can we demonstrate this in people? And that's not easy, I can tell you. But what we tried to do was to uh, look at people that ha had vagotomies. So here we're looking at people with a truncal vagotomy up here. Uh, this was done for Judean and also, but we also had other patients with different indications. And uh, here we're looking at something that is affected normally by GOP1, namely gastric emptying. So here we're looking at gastric emptying rates. It looks like this. And uh, then we, if in these controls here, we can give them GLP-1 and you can see that you can very powerfully inhibit gastric emptying with GLP-1. And here we have the people with vagotomy. They have a completely different gastric emptying pattern. But as you can see here very clearly, when they get GLP-1, it doesn't work anymore at all. So there's a very powerful effect of the vagotomy here. And if you look at the food intake, and that was the purpose of it, of course, uh, in the controls, we have the effect of GLP-1 on food intake and appetite here. But in those with the vagotomy, the effect was gone. So we think there is a good support for this idea that it is the afferent sensory mechanism that is the important one. There are also other ways to get into the brain, of course, because there are the leaks in the blood-brain barrier. And if you think of something like miraglutide, it probably hits or reaches the brain via these leaks. And here we have one in the area of streamer. And what has been done here is activation uh, of neurons that has been looked on uh, at with CFOS activation. And you can see, yes, there is some activation in the nucleus of the solitary tract, as I showed you, but there is even more perhaps in the area per streamer. So um, those uh, agonists that we're using today, they probably reach the brain via these leaks in the blood brain, whereas the natural endogenous compound probably uses the um, vagal afferent system. So we have this molecule that uh, had all these effects um, of, of, of the um, metabolism. And uh, if you compare the type two diabetic phenotype with the actions of GLP-1, you can see that they're very, um, uh, they're very comp complementary. So we have all these defects in the beta cell function in the people with diabetes. And then we have all the actions of GLP-1, increasing secretion, improving beta cell function, upregulating all the genes that are required for this. And we have the reduced beta cell mass. And there's a lot of indication that at least 
uh, GLP-1 is protective for beta cells. And we have the glucagon problem, glucagon hypersecretion, and could inhibit glucagon secretion. And we have overeating and obesity, and here we have something that can inhibit food intake and cause a weight loss. We have all the, uh, the vascular complications, and then it turns out that there are also cardiovascular effects, and we will talk to them upon that very briefly. And insulin resistance was actually also improved uh, during therapy, probably due to the uh, metabolic control. And the problem, of course, was when using this new principle for diabetes that we had this problem with the DPP-4 sensitivity of the molecule and also this very, very short half-life. So you can't treat people with an agent like this. Um, but on the other hand, what could we do about that? Um, so it's really a serious degradation of the molecule. If you look at what happens if you inject type 2 diabetic individuals with GLP-1 in a high dose and look at how much survives in the intact form, it's just these, this very little part here that is surviving in the intact form. It's just a few percent. Everything else is metabolized and inactive. So uh, what we thought was that perhaps we can interfere with the system by inhibiting the DPP-4 enzyme. And then uh, just as we, we, as we knew how to do it with the ACE inhibitors to treat hypertension, we might be able to, uh, to manage type 2 diabetes with a DPP, uh, DPP-4 inhibitor. And we tried that then. So here are some experiments we did in pigs. Uh, they were infused with GLP-1 here and glucose to stimulate insulin secretion a little bit. And then they were given valine pyrrolidide, which was an inhibitor of this enzyme. And then we could repeat the whole thing afterwards. And here we're looking at GLP-1 concentrations, the intact form here and the metabolite here. And you can see that in spite of this continued infusion, a very small proportion of GLP-1 is actually intact. But once we have inhibited the enzyme, everything was intact here as seen here. And now we could look at insulin secretion and that's what we did. And you can see here before and after the DPP-4 inhibition that we had a, a much, much, much greater insulin response afterwards. So it really worked. We could protect GLP-1 from degradation and we could enhance insulin secretion afterwards. And this of course led to the development of the DPP-4 inhibitors that are now all over the world for the treatment of, of diabetes. Now, uh, the other possibility uh, to solve the problem of the short half-life of GLP-1 was, of course, to create resistant GLP-1 receptor agonists. And we have a lot of them today, as, you, as is shown here. There are some that are based on an, a molecule that is called Exendin, which was derived from a lizard. Uh, they have a, a resemblance to the human GLP-1 molecule, and they are typically short-lived. Short uh, and then you have some uh, uh, forms that are based on the human GLP-1 structure, and they, of course, need something uh, has to be done. So uh, some of them have a fatty acid attached to the molecule that makes it survive, uh, bind to albumin and escape renal elimination and degradation by DPP-4. And they exist in several forms here. And uh, some of them were uh, attached to large molecules, just like the Dulac glutide molecule, and more recently, the f molecule, FC fragments, that, that is. Uh, here we have the TLP-1 moiety, and here we have it here. So, so, uh, so um, uh, these molecules, uh, were resistant and could survive for a long time. And actually, these over here are usually uh, uh, can be used for a week, therefore used for weekly dosing. So let me just uh, show this single illustration of the most one of the most recent GLP-1 agonists, and this is actually even a GIP GLP-1 co agonist. It's unclear how much the GIP actually contributes to the uh, activities, but let me show you this: that in these doses. A1C in type 2 diabetic individuals were reduced down to less than 5.7%. And 5.7%, that is a normal value. So what this shows that is that in 50% of these people, there was diabetes remission after administration of this compound. And at the same time, there was a huge weight loss of 12.4 kilograms. So these new GLP-1 receptor agonists, they're very, very powerful, both in terms of weight loss and uh, diabetes therapy. So what I've said is that about GLP-1, the physiological actions of the hormone include that there, it's a second in line increase in hormone, GIP is the first, but it has important effects on inhibition of appetite and food intake. And 
Inhibiting the DPP4 enzyme will rescue GLP-1 and enhance its anti-diabetic actions. And this is what is being in, exploited in all the DPP-4 inhibitors. The long-acting GLP-1 analogs are very effective anti-diabetic drugs, the most effective we have today. They beat insulin in all the trials where this is looked at. They're also the most powerful anti-obesity drugs we know. And then on top of that, they protect the cardiovascular system and they also prevent stroke. And this is really, really interesting. So there are a lot of good things ahead of us in terms of GLP-1 agonists. Thank you.